Sailing from Tanzania on the east coast of Africa, over 1,700 miles south to Richards Bay in South Africa is not an easy proposition. Strong currents and very strong weather systems are a major problem. Hello, we are Patrick and Rebecca Childress on the sailboat Brick House, a Valiant 40. We are in the very large city of Dar es Salaam in the country of Tanzania on the east coast of Africa. And we need to get over 1,700 miles south along this coast to Richards Bay in South Africa. We thought we were going to spend a week or two in Dar es Salaam casually putting on supplies and preparing for this trip south. But suddenly our plans have changed. This incredible storm with over 70 knots of wind right at the choke point between Madagascar and the coast of Africa is wrecking havoc along those coasts. But we are going to jump out of here today and ride the tail of that tiger as it's giving us north winds to blow us south. So we scrambled to say our goodbyes to all of the people who treated us so well here at the marina facilities in Dar es Salaam and then get into town to get our groceries and then start siphoning fuel into our fuel tanks so we can top off our fuel for this trip south. I don't want fuel stored on deck. I want our jugs empty. We were anticipating heavy seas, waves washing over the deck, and I want as little to cause a problem on deck, fuel spillage and so forth as possible. The jugs will live there, but they will be empty and they will be tied down very tightly and securely. Siphoning fuel into our tanks, we always put our fuel through a very fine mesh filter, which also is hydrophobic. That is, it'll separate out any water from the fuel before it ever goes into the tank. So we have the cleanest fuel possible as we put it into the tanks. Additionally, a very important ingredient is adding biocide to prevent any kind of microbe growth. Another important project is to fully inflate our rib dinghy. It has a very slow leak, which only requires inflating it every three days or so. I want it fully inflated now because I rely on it. I, re I lean against it as I work my way around to the foredeck. And you never know, what if we run into any kind of a problem? We have to use the dinghy as a tugboat to get us off of the rocks or a sandbar. I want the dinghy fully functional and ready to go. So it's always a little sad leaving a harbor that we like so much and the people that we have gotten to know and will never see again. But that's the way of world cruising. There's always more horizons and good people up ahead. And that's what keeps us going. Sailing out the harbor and turning right to head south. It's just amazing. All of the anchored freighters and shipping that is just off of the coast. So we thread our way through this labyrinth of ships. And it's a great caution for us to keep a very close vigilance on the horizon, on our instruments and stay out of their way. There's enough dangers just with the weather and currents. We don't need to have encounters with the large ships as well. Coming this close to the bow of an anchored ship near a harbor, it just makes me think of people that we know who have been hit by a ship far out at sea. And what a terrible, scary situation that must have been. They did survive. Their boat was not too terribly damaged, but it did affect them enough to where they sold their boat at their first opportunity. So the strategy of sailing the East African coast is to go from one well-protected harbor to another and then wait and see what their weather allows. Don't push one's luck and just skip on down to the next harbor and hope that the weather holds. So our first stop will be Mikandani Harbor, 225 nautical miles to our south. And what will be nice on this passage is that we have a half moon now and it is only getting fuller. So it's nice to have a full moon on night passages. You can see the deck, you can see the sails, and you have a pretty good idea of what lays just off of the bow. In the pitch black nights with no moon, it's kind of a scary proposition. You just don't know what's out there. So we have to pay very close attention to the radar and our other electronic eyes. So Rebecca checks the weather and still we're good to head south. We do have some north winds to blow us on south. That terrible weather far to our south is dissipating and shouldn't cause us any trouble and actually will help to pull us on along this coast. However, the, our latest report is showing that our north wind will start to lighten and to turn into va variables. So once we get to Mick and Danny, we will see what the weather then allows us to do. 
So we made good time and we approached McIndanny in the middle of the night. This is an unfamiliar harbor. It is not well marked. So we just lay off the coast for several hours until the sun starts to come up and then we work our way in. So McIndanny is a nice little cove, very well protected. No other cruising sailboats here, just some local fishermen and only one place to pull our dinghy on shore. However, the last minute weather report that we got says that we cannot stay here long. The weather is conducive to pushing on. So we have to take advantage of the favorable winds. We just run ashore. We go into town very quickly. This area is 15 miles north of the Mozambique border. So we clear out of the country of Tanzania here, the last we'll ever see of this territory and head on south all in the same day. It was a very long night. We we're both very tired, but we have to push on and we'll just do a tag team for watches and let the other person sleep and try to get caught up on their rest. We don't have a set watch schedule. One person tries to sleep day or night while the other person is on watch. The person on watch stays up till they feel they can finally go no further than wakes up the rested person. To be honest, during the day, if we have seen nothing in the way of ships or fishing boats, we might lean a bit more on our electronic eyes, AIS and radar, than on our own site to keep a constant lookout. Because of the variable winds that we're now encountering, we're using just about every sail combination imaginable. But we cannot waste time. We have to push on. Eventually, we work our way down to Cabo Candusia, and this is the choke point between Madagascar and Mozambique, the East African coast, which causes a lot of trouble for many sailors. But fortunately, the luck is in our favor, and we pass this cape without any problems. And this rain squall was really no problem. We just go down to the single jib for sailing. We got a very good rinsing. And it certainly did make me think, though, of one time when some friends and I delivered a 46-foot Nordhaven trawler from Connecticut to Fort Lauderdale. And now I can certainly appreciate all the advantages of having indoor steering, a wheelhouse with heat when it gets cold, and air conditioning when it gets hot, and a windshield wiper. But my wheelhouse right now is a bit of plastic Dodger and my Henry Lloyd foul weather gear. However, later that night, we did have another rain squall, but it was far more intense. The wind came out of the northwest at up to 50 knots of wind. And all I had up was the little stay sail, but I would love to have gotten that rolled up. Possibly I could have, but I didn't want to risk flogging itself to death in those kind of winds, so I lived with it. And the wind did not get over 50 knots, but it sure gave us some great sailing progress south. The scariest thing about that storm, however, was not the sails or the boat, it was the wind generator. That wind generator was spinning so wildly it sounded like a Cessna 172 engine that was over revving. And all I could think of is about those blades coming flying off, and hopefully if they did, off into the distance. I have heard of several wind generators of different manufacturers, and one like ours, where the blades did fly off, or at least one blade flew off. And fortunately, it did go off into the distance. It didn't hit the boat. It didn't hit anybody. So there was no other damage other than to the wind generator. And this is one reason why we inspect our generator blades very carefully, especially at the root, at the very base of the blades, to make sure there are no cracks that can get worse. We can turn on the brake on the wind generator, but over 30 knots of wind, the brake really does little good. So I have to physically grab a line on the tail of the wind generator and turn it around backwards to stop the blades and then tie them off. But in this high wind, it was just far too dangerous to even try that. So I lived with that wild noise and just kept my fingers crossed. And fortunately, everything held together. Another thing is that there was some wild lightning that we went through. And of course, thunder. Our boat has never been struck by lightning. And I know of other boats that have sailed the world and have never been struck by lightning. But then we always hear about those other odd boats that have been struck twice by lightning. So you wonder, why is this? 
One thing that we have on the top of our mast is called a witch's broom. It's supposed to be a lightning or ion dissipator and makes us less attractive to lightning. An electrical engineer once told me that there is no scientific reason why this witch's broom would protect our boat from a lightning strike. But he also did add, if you haven't been hit yet, there's no reason to take it down. A knowledgeable cruising friend has a theory, and that's what he calls it, just a theory, that as long as a mass is properly grounded, it'll bleed off any static buildup and make a mass less attractive to a lightning strike. So we have a wire going from our mast to a bronze prop shaft strut. It would do no good to have a wire from the mast to a keel bolt, as most keels are encased in fiberglass or well painted against contact with the outside seawater. That'll bleed off any static buildup in the mast and help to protect their boat. So far, in all the boats that I have ever sailed on, we I have never been hit by lightning. I have felt electricity through the handrail at the binnacle when a lightning bolt hit nearby on the water surface. It's something that we do take very seriously and at times we disconnect our electronics and put them in the stove like conventional wisdom says to do and so far we have made it through all these terrible lightning storms without harm. Now this is an interesting navigational situation that Rebecca came up on late one night on her watch. There is a fishing boat off to our starboard moving to starboard and then there is also a non-moving AIS marker. So Rebecca called the fishing boat to see what's going on and asked if he was towing anything. And he said, yes, he's towing his long line. And so Rebecca asked, well, is it safe to pass behind him? He said, yes, his long line will be deep enough. It won't be any problem for us to pass behind. And so we did, we kept on this course. We went through the fishing boat and that AIS marker and had no problems. However, in Southeast Asia, oftentimes you'll see two fishing boats traveling side by side at new, not too far of a distance from each other. And they will be towing between them a net. And we know one cruiser who met these two boats head on and went right down the center thinking that would be the thing to do. And only once he passed these boats, he realized just what he was getting himself into. He could very possibly be catch of the day, but it was far too late to turn around. All he did was slow way down and wait for a big kaplump and fortunately it never came and he just kept on his way and the fishing boats that were towing the net never made any indication to the sailboat that there would be any problem before we could get to Bazar Uto the 25 knot south winds hit and there's no way in the world we could motor against 25 knots of wind to thread our way through this labyrinth of shoals to get to the safe anchoring spot the only way we could work against this wind would be to time going in to this area at low tide while it is then flooding. While the current is running strong, but not too strong. As long as the chart indicates sufficient water in the channels for our keel to safely go over, we like to go into these questionable areas at low tide. The theory there is if we should run into any navigational problems and find ourselves hard aground, the rising tide will easily lift us off. If we went in at high tide and ran into problems, it's only disaster from there, especially now that we have a full moon, high and low tide. If we ran aground on a full moon, high tide, it could be another month before we would have any hope of being lifted off. Of course, there will be some turbulence that we anticipate, and the biggest danger would be going broadside to the wind or to the current through a channel. But we'll just have to pay very close attention and keep a heavy hand on the throttle. So on the way in, we certainly saw the, the expected whirlpools and currents developing, and this area of the channel that ran perpendicular to the wind and the current is where we saw the worst white caps and it wasn't all that terribly bad and actually it wasn't that difficult maintaining our course down the center of this channel the wind was pushing us one way the current the other so it's a very steady maneuver without any major complications we just hit a couple waves here and there and once we got closer to the island and then turned farther south more directly into the wind all the white caps just suddenly disappeared. But what's most important about all of this is laying down a very good closely spaced track. Move back out of here, whether it's day or night, 
will have a very safe passage and will feel far more secure leaving this place than when we did arrive to it. I don't want to sound too casual about any of this. We felt like we did deserve a nice little break once we anchored and a good toast of a big glass of wine. But soon after that, the fishermen showed up. What a bunch of nice guys. So we always have line to trade. We have sunglasses, hats, fishing line, rope, all kinds of things that we love to give to these guys. So these guys would be back. No matter how long we are here, we'll be well fed with seafood. But we could be here for days, weeks, months. We have no idea what the weather will allow us to do. But for now, it isn't letting us go anywhere. In the next video, we'll be anchored at another very out of the way place off of Mozambique. And then in the middle of the night, we have to pick up and get the heck out of there. Right into over 25 knots of wind right on the nose. That was a much safer, more pleasant option than staying anchored where we were. But thanks a lot for watching. I hope this video was good for you. If it was, give us a thumbs up and subscribe down below. And I get to tell you about the tip jar, which is at www.whereisbrickhouse.com. And also there is a link in the video's description down below. Okay, thanks. We'll see you soon.